Wednesday. Someone requested loud music this morning to help them wake up. I hope that did the trick. If Japan Droids doesn't wake you up, then I don't know what else to try.、Um, all right, so today we're going to continue talking about objects. Specifically, we're going to talk about how objects get created. And if we have time at the end, we'll start talking about a little bit of the ways that Java provides us to control access to the objects that we create, which helps. Make sure that the people that are using these objects use them properly. All right, but, but first of all, I mean, there's, there, I guess there's been some speculation online about what I think about before class, right? So、um, I guess that's me. It's not a particularly flattering photo, I'm very backlit.、Um, and it says, Jeff's thinking about how bad we are at CS,、um, which, is, which is not actually true. That's not what I think about before class. So, there's a whole bunch of random things, right? So, today, you know, just, just to sort of clear up this, things I was thinking about before class. So, one of the things I looked at before class today was I computed how much time the class has spent on the homework problems in the four weeks that we've been together. So, it's a pretty, pretty awesome number. So, all told, all 850 of you, or how many there are, have collectively spent 730 hours. On the homework problems.、Um, I don't know how many days that is, but that's a long time. So the, the people in this room, people in this class, have been working, and that's what's going to help you improve. Other things I think about, usually I think about, man, that's a great song. You know,、uh, that's, that goes through my head a lot.、Um, you know, is the music too loud? Am I going to remember what to talk about today?、Um, You know, sometimes I do a little bit of online shopping while I'm waiting for class to start.、Um, anyway, I, I, I really am 100% supportive of you guys,、um, and you, you are learning. Like, that is actually happening. We can see progress. I'm excited about it. The TAs are excited about it. The CAs are excited about it.、Um, I know this is a point in the class where, you know, I was talking with my TAs yesterday in Chinny. So, Chinny. Some of you have probably interacted with Chinny, just like a fantastic guy, super positive person. He said that his lab sections yesterday were depressed. Like, people were sad and demotivated and things like that. So, you know,、uh, this may be a point in the semester to just sort of like pick yourself up a little bit.、Uh, again, sort of remember how far you've come at this point in the semester and that the whole core staff is here rooting for you、um, and here to help, right? You know, all, as much as we can. The other thing I want to point out, so. You know, particularly if you're a beginner in this class and you've been struggling, you've been putting in the time and energy, you can see yourself improving. But, you know, we, we hear things like this all the time. So, you know, I get really discouraged when I'm in lab or when I'm in office hours and there's somebody who's just way better at this than I am. And they just finish it really quickly. You know, like I've been in office hours for six hours and this person comes in and sits down and they're just like, boom, 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 done. Right?、Um, you know, I, I'm sure many of you have had this experience. That, but the thing is, so, so imagine you're running a race, right? And there's, there's someone who's been up ahead of you, and you know,、like、you're trying, you're running really hard, and they're, they're, they're getting closer and closer and closer, and finally you're sort of going by them. So at that moment, you don't look over and be like, that person looks like you know, it's really easy for them, right? Like, they look like they're not trying very hard, like this is all coming very naturally to them. You're like, wow, all that hard work paid off. I'm, I'm catching up. So, When you're spending more time than other people around you, I mean, this, this is important to think about in the right way. I firmly believe that there is really very little to no innate ability that generates your ability to do computer science. I just don't, I don't believe it. Computers are too new and they're too weird. They don't make any sense. I mean, it's not like you grew up, you know, some people, it's like, You know, they have a certain knack for certain things, right? This may be developed because they grew up around them or whatever. Computers are so unnatural、um, that I really just don't believe this. And if it's true, it's a very, very, very small effect. What gets you to the point where you can do this stuff is work and practice. And that's the philosophy that this course is designed around. So if you're doing more work than somebody else, like that gap is closing, you're bringing down that skill gap. Part of my job with this class is to take a big group like you of enthusiastic students and close that gap. Some of you came in with a lot of experience, some of you came in with zero. When I'm done, 
I want to have brought you closer together. Not by, hopefully I'm not making the smarter students more stupid, that's not my goal. Um, but you know, the people who are just starting out have to work a little harder, but you guys are gonna come farther by the end of the semester. And you know, then I'm gonna hand you off to Carl, or to Wade, or to, you know, the people downstream, and they're gonna do that a little bit more, and by the time you make it to, you know, the really awesome 300 and 400 level classes in the department, or by the time you make it out into industry or whatever, the goal is that gap is gone, right? But my job is to take a big whack at it, and so that's what we're doing this semester. So again, if you're, if you're spending a lot of time, you're doing the work, that's good. Like, that will work. It's the only thing that does. Okay, so don't get discouraged. All right, let's talk about this. So we had some questions about this after last lecture, and I wanna try to sort of clear up a little bit about um, what this is, and then we'll see another use of this in a minute. So instance variables, so instances of a class can refer to their instance variables by using the this keyword. And this always refers to whatever instance is executing a particular method. That's not required. So some people pointed out, you know, hey, I can do things like this. This will also work. So compare this example where my area function uses this to explicitly refer to the integer instance variables width and height. In this example, it will do the same thing. So how does this work? So when, when Java compiles this code, what it does is it, it starts to work on compiling the area method, and it sees a variable called width. And it says, huh, where does this variable come from? It looks in the function that you've defined called area, and it says, is there any variable in this enclosing scope? And the answer is no. There are no parameters past the area, and I haven't declared a single variable. It's a one-line function. The next place it looks is within the class that wraps that method. So the next thing it does is it says, okay, so I didn't find a width within the function area, now I'll look on the class. And lo and behold, there's an instance variable called width. Good, I'll use that, right? Same thing with height. So this is how name Java does name resolution. Oh, one thing I need to point out, sorry, this is a little bit of a random digression. So from the, from the, this point in the semester forward, as we start to experiment with objects, the examples we do in class are gonna work differently. Okay, so before we were allowing you to define functions and run them sort of like within the block of code you were writing. Now what we're gonna do is every example is going to run the main function of the example class. And then we'll also define other classes within our uh, playground in order to experiment with objects. Make sense? So when I run this, it's gonna print hello world. Um, and we'll get more practice with this today. So this is because this allows us to define objects and experiment with relationships between them and things like that. It's also a little bit of a better match of what happens when you actually run Java code. Remember we talked about before, every Java program starts in a main method. That's always where execution begins. Okay. So, let's do an example here. So this uh, is similar to what we did last time. I'm just gonna show you a little bit of the trade-offs here, right? You might think that this looks cleaner. It does look cleaner. And in most cases, this is the exactly right thing to do. So I have my dimensions class that we talked about last time. It, it holds information about the dimensions of something. In this case, two-dimensional um, dimensions of some sort of two-dimensional thing. So I have a width and a height. And then I also have this area method, because functions allow me to, you know, encapsulate both state and behavior, both data and algorithm. So my data here is the width and height for this particular dimensions instance. And the algorithm that I'm providing, although it's a simple one, is computing the area. So here on line six, this function is using syntax that will refer to those width and height variables that are defined on the class. So if I run this, I get the example that I thought I would. And again, see how these new examples are working. So now what's happening is I'm starting execution in example.main. And I'm gonna run that on line 11. 
I create a new dimensions object. On line 12 and 13, I initialize its width and height, and then on line 14, I print off the result of calling the area method that it provides. Okay, but let's make a small change here. Let's do this. Let's allow our area method to take a parameter called width, okay? So now when I call area, I'm gonna have to pass it something, so I'm gonna pass it 20 here. So now what do you think is going to happen? First time I ran this, width referred to the instance variable that was defined on that class called width. Now what is width going to refer to? Any guesses? So when Java compiles your code, it says, okay, there's a reference to a variable called width on line six. Where is that variable coming from? The first place it looks is in the function itself. Is there a variable called width here? Yeah, it passes a parameter. It's one of the parameters to the function. So what's gonna happen if I run this is it's not going to use the width that's defined on the class. It's gonna use the width that's passed in the, as a parameter. So this is where things get a little bit, can get a little bit confusing. If I want to be really clear here, I can explicitly tell the compiler to use the width that's defined on the class by prefacing it with this dot. So in this case, I'm gonna get 200 again. Let me put a little printf here just so you guys can see what's going on. Right here, width this is 20. Oh, sorry. This dot width. Uh, okay, this is good. Width this 20. Let's also print out this dot width. Right. Make sense? So width is going to refer to the parameter that was passed at the function. This dot width explicitly reaches back to the class and gets the width that's defined there. Yeah, question? Will the rubber test file <laughs> Yeah, so the question was, will check style catch this? I don't think so. But what will catch it is IntelliJ. So if you try to do this in IntelliJ, you're gonna get a warning message. And the warning message is gonna say, the parameter is shadowing an instance variable. I don't know if anyone has seen this yet when they've been working on our MPs, but you may see it when you start working on MP3. This is generally considered bad practice because it's confusing. So we'll, we'll see in a minute a case where it's very natural to have parameters that have the same names as your instance variables, and I'll show you kind of a naming convention that will avoid this type of conflict. Why is there a... Why is this here? Just for clarity. Yeah, there's no, there's no need for it to be here. We could do this. When I lay out classes, I like to separate the instance variables from the methods, but this is just a style thing. Whatever, whatever allows this to be more readable to you. Good question. Okay. So let's talk about constructors. So again, we're trying to peel back layers here. We're trying to explain things as we go along. It's a hard thing about Java. Frequently have to show you how to do something and then come back and explain it later. So we've showed you how to create objects using this new keyword. And then what came after new was the name of the class that we were creating an new instance of, a new instance of, and then something that looked like a function call. I always said, what is that? You guys have done this with strings. If I don't use the string literal, I can initialize the string by saying string s is equal to new string, and then I put a string literal inside that. That looks like a function call. It is a function call. And the function that gets called is a special function called a constructor. So the constructor for a class gets called once, when the object is created, when an instance of the object is created. Let me try to be more clear about that. The constructor gets called every time an instance of the object gets created. So whenever I call new, whenever I use the new keyword, what follows is a call to that class's constructor. The constructor is responsible for setting up 
the new object, the new instance of that class. And the constructor is a function. It's code. It can do anything it wants. It can initialize the instance variables. It can do computation. Um, when we talk about errors in a couple of lectures, it can throw errors or exceptions. Um, there's only one thing it can't do that we'll talk about in a second. But in general, you should think about the constructor as just code. It's code that you get to define as part of your class that determines how the class gets created. So any sort of class-specific initialization you want to do, uh, you can do in your constructor. It's typical for constructors to initialize the fields, the instance variables of a class. So what we've been doing up till this point, because we haven't talked about constructors yet, is we've been doing things like this, where I create an instance of a dimensions object on line 13, and then on lines 14 and 15, I initialize its instance variables. But it's much more canonical in Java to have the constructor do this. So instead of this, and we can come back and fix this in a minute, I would say, you know, new dimensions 10, 20. And then I could get rid of this code here. And the call to the constructor would set up those fields for me. So again, this is just a fun, just another function call. The constructor on a class has a little bit of a special syntax. So you'll see a couple things that are different about it from the functions that we've seen before. First of all, a constructor always shares the name of the class. It has to. That's how Java knows it's the constructor. There's no way to create a constructor that doesn't follow that pattern. So if I wanted to create a constructor for the course class, I have to call it course. And because it shares the name of the class, it's also capitalized. It's really probably the only time in Java that at least check style is gonna allow you to break the normal convention for naming functions, which is to use camel case starting with a lowercase character. When you write a constructor, you use the name of the class, the class is uppercase because it's an object, and so you have a uh, uppercase function. What's the other thing that's different about this function declaration? Yeah, it, there's, there's no return declaration, right? So we're used to seeing something to the left of capital course, and then the open parentheses. We're used to seeing a return type. The reason there's no return type is the constructor always returns a new instance of that class. And in fact, it can't return anything else. It can't return null, for example. So there's no way for a constructor to fail and return null. This is sort of a, in my opinion, an unfortunate weakness of Java as a language. But there are ways for constructors to fail, and again, we'll come back and talk about that when we talk about errors and exceptions. But for now, you can think a constructor has to return, it has to return um, instance of the object. You don't actually return anything. In fact, I don't think you can use a return statement inside a constructor. But it's always going to return a new instance of that object. Like other functions in Java, I can overload constructors. And this is very, very, very common. So some of you have been taking 196 or have learned about Python in the past. So Python has this really nice feature where I can provide default arguments for various parameters to a function. In Java, sadly, you can't do that. You can with some of the newer Java variants, but I can achieve kind of the same behavior by overloading the function. So in this case, I'm providing two different ways to create a new course object. One constructor takes a string name, the other constructor does not. So the constructor on line four takes an argument that uses to set the name of the course. The constructor on line eight does not take an argument, and it sets the name to an empty string. When you create a class, you're in charge. You can define any set of constructors you want. You don't have to provide a constructor that takes no arguments, for example. You can force people that use your class to initialize it in a certain way. This is one of the things that's nice about constructors. All right, so here's another use for the this keyword. And again, this is also very common. So inside the constructor, 
I can use this to call other constructors. So it, it's common to follow the following pattern. So to have a single constructor, and we'll, you guys will do this for MP3. We're going to require you to create several different constructors for the MP object, for the MP class that you're gonna be working on. Um, and, you know, you don't wanna duplicate code inside those. This is not a place where you wanna cut and paste. But what's common is you have one constructor that sets all of the fields on the object according to whatever is passed, whatever the user wants. And then you might have other constructors that take fewer arguments and that use default values for information that the user has not chosen to provide. The best way to do this is essentially to use the this keyword to call another constructor internally, again, rather than duplicating code between constructors. So how does this work? I've got two constructors here. One of them, again, allows me to set the name of the course. The other sets it to an empty string. So what we would say is the name of the course by default is blank. Better than null, right? Rather than doing what we did in the previous slide, which I could do, where I could just set this dot name directly, I'm calling so that call on line 10 using this is gonna call the constructor that takes a single string argument. So when this code executes, if I create a new course object without passing a parameter, Java's gonna find the course constructor with no arguments, since that matches the call that the client is making. And then that's gonna call this with a string argument. I'm now calling a constructor that takes a string literal. Java says, okay, I know how to do that. There's one of those on line four. That runs, and the new instance of the course class is created and returned. Okay, if you don't create it, so, so we have not, you know, we've been creating objects, but we haven't been creating constructors. How does this work? So if you don't define a constructor, it's an equivalent of an empty constructor that doesn't set any fields. So, you know, by default, the course object creates a constructor that looks like this, just empty. And so any instance variables that are present on that class don't get initialized. This is usually not what you want to do, right? So for example, um, what would the string name be set to, this is a good question, by the default constructor? So if I don't initialize name, what's name going to be? So name stores a reference to a string object, but I haven't created it, so by default it's, no, right? So by default, name on the course object would be set to null. And particularly when you're working with objects, that's why it's a good, it's good practice to use the constructor as a chance to set fields like this, so that you don't, they don't get set to null values, right? You don't have to worry about them later. Better to set it to some default value like an empty string. Okay. So like I said before, constructors must return a new instance of their class. They can either return a new instance of their class or they can throw an exception, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later. So unfortunately, and again, this is, this is a frustrating feature of Java, in my opinion, there's no way for the constructor to reject bad inputs. So let's say you have rules about how courses get named, right? Like maybe it has to start with two letters and then a number and then a colon or something like that. And you, you can check that in the constructor. But what do you do if somebody passes you a bad name. So there's no way to return null. There's no way to reject that input. We don't have a way to do that yet. Again, in a couple lectures, we'll talk about errors and exceptions, and we'll see ways that constructors can fail, ways that constructors can return, you know, uh, it can throw an exception um, so that the, the caller knows that, hey, you know, you provided me with bad data. That's one of the things that we frequently like to do in the constructor is make sure that our inputs are okay. An another thing we'll talk about when we talk about class methods or static methods, so when you write Java code today, a lot of times you don't see new. You don't see constructors. And the reason is there's a function, and again, this is something you're gonna do for MP3, there's a function, another function that you're calling that's internally calling new. 
And the reason for this is that that function can then potentially return null and reject bad inputs, right? And again, we'll come back and talk about this when we talk about static on Friday. Okay, so. I'm gonna give you guys a couple of minutes to work on this. Um, this is a person class. We created this before. Um, fill out this class with a couple of fields, and then create a couple of constructors. And I, I will sort of let you decide at your seat which constructors you want to provide and which ones you don't. All right, so I'm gonna give you three minutes to work on this, bang something out, and then we'll go over it together. So, so by the way, when we do these examples, this is part of participation points for that day. You know, I do expect you guys to try to, to figure these things out, do something, right? All right, what are some fields? So this is something that we're gonna do repeatedly for the next couple weeks. We're gonna use objects to design models, right, that combine state and behavior. So what are some pieces of information that we might want to know about a person. Things that we think, so this is the way you start object model, right? What is something that I might want to know about a person? Yeah. What's that? Age, yeah. And how are we gonna represent age? We could use an int, we could use a double. I mean, technically age is a continuous, you know, value, but, so let's use a double. Let's have a little fun with this, so we're gonna say double age, okay? What else? I heard some other piece of university-specific information, potentially. Let's say this person is a student or affiliate of the University of Illinois, what, might, what else might we want to know about them? Yeah, we could store their university ID number. We could say int. That's an, that's an integer. Chuck Style's gonna complain about this, but that's all right. 
Sometimes you know better than it does. Yeah. What's that? Oh, that's a good point. I'm in the wrong window. Thank you. There we go. Okay. What else? What's some other information about person I might want to know? Name, yeah. I'm gonna s store name as a string. So it turns out that, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I could store a first name and a last name. Good luck with that. Yeah, names, names are tough. Not everybody has a first name or a last name. Um, so sometimes it's better just to say, this is your name. What part of it's the first part and what part of it's the last part, I don't, don't want to worry about. I'm just gonna, your name is a string. Maybe it only has one part, maybe it has four parts. I don't know. All right, what else? Yeah. Ooh, yeah, we have, a, we have someone who's very, wants to know everything about you here, right? So that we could put your social security number, right? Um, driver's license number, okay, I like that. Driver's license number. All right. Okay, so this, this is fine. You know, we, we have a good starting point. So now let's create a constructor. And again, I, I would suggest starting with a constructor that sets all of the fields, that allows the caller to set all of the fields when they create the object. And, you know, because I have some low-grade form of OCD, I would probably also uh, put them in order. I'm gonna reorder this a little bit, just to satisfy my low-grade OCD. All right. So, a constructor. Remember, it doesn't return anything shares the name of the class. So this constructor that sets all the fields is going to take a series of arguments, and I'm gonna use this naming convention where I say set and then the name of the instance variable that's being set. Oops. Drivers license number. Let me rename this. Just so I can get back on the previous line. Great. Okay. And so what am I gonna do in here? I've been passed four parameters. I'm gonna use those parameters to set the field. This code is so, you know, sometimes we refer to this in computer science as boilerplate. It's mechanical. You can actually get IntelliJ to generate this for you. And some of you may appreciate using this feature on MP3. So there's a, there's a thing where if you right click once you have an object and you've added some some instance variables to it, you can tell, tell IntelliJ, I want to generate a constructor that sets these fields, and it'll basically just generate the code we're about to write. But in this case, I'm doing this in class, so I'm gonna say name is equal to set name, age is equal to set age, UIN is equal to set UIN, and license number is equal to, oops, I broke my naming convention here, set license number. Okay, great. So now I have, you know, again, what we think of as a full constructor that sets all the fields on the object. What's gonna happen now when I run this code? And you can try it. What's gonna happen? Let's give it a shot. I don't know why that keeps happening. Ah, right. So now that I've provided a constructor, the object doesn't, the class doesn't use the default constructor anymore. And so what the compiler is complaining about is the fact that there's no applicable constructor for a call to create an instance of the person class that takes no arguments. So again, part of <clears throat> creating constructors is that you now define how the class works, how the class is created. You can require that someone who is using your class provide you with data when they create a new instance of the class. So in this case, I'm doing that, and I'm actually saying you have to provide me everything. So let's do this for uh, 14, approximately. Um, so, so this is, well, my dog doesn't have a UIN, but we'll just use something silly. Um, and then also license number, you know, so, so we, we, we run into one of these cases, and this is common when you're modeling things, where 
You know, what if someone doesn't have a license number? What do you, what do you guys think would be a, de a decent default value if someone doesn't have a driver's license? I am sure that not everybody in this room has a driver's license. And in some of your cases, I'm pretty happy about that, seeing you drive. <laughs> um, default value, someone doesn't have a driver's license? It's like negative one. Yeah, that's not a, I mean, driver's license numbers are typically. Okay. So now, I've created, and this is not me, rename this, this is Choo Choo, so now I can look at the fields on my new person and make sure that they are what I think they should be, and that's correct. BYN seems like it was set correctly. Um, let me print off the name. Okay, good. So let's write a different constructor. Let's write a constructor that takes no arguments. So I've got my person class. Let me write a second constructor. So in this case, I need to provide default values for all of these fields. Now, you may not want to allow this, right? You may say, look, everybody's got a name and an age. Like, if you can't provide that, we're in trouble. And in fact, you know, let's, let's just make that a requirement. Let's make that it a requirement that you have to provide me with a name and an age. Any person that I'm gonna model using this class has to have these two things, okay? But not everybody has a university ID, not everybody has a driver's license number. So, now I could, like I said, I could duplicate the code I have above, or I could use the fact that I can call another constructor. And here, the person creating the new person class has not, or the, the, the code that creates the new person class has not provided me with all the information I need, so I need to use some default fields, and I'm gonna use negative one as the field that indicates that the person doesn't have either a UIN or a driver's license number, or simply the person writing the code hasn't provided me with that information yet. Maybe later they will, but for now, this person object has not provided me that information. And again, now I can create a new instance of the person class, and I can print out information about it. Any questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I'm overloading the constructor. The constructor is a function like any other function. I'm overloading it. And, you know, if you look at real Java classes, they sometimes have, you know, like, 10 constructors, right, that take different arguments, right? You know, one that takes ints, another that takes doubles, whatever. I mean, yeah, so it's common for, for Java to provide lots of different constructors. You might argue that Python has a better way to do this, and I might agree. Great question. So does Chuchu have a UIN? Yeah, he does. So what happened when I used, let me pull this down a little bit, it's taking up too much space. What happened when I used the constructor that takes two arguments? So I called the constructor defined on line 13, it called the constructor defined on line 7, and it called it with the arguments, the name I provided, the age I provided, to the original two argument constructor, but then it provided negative one for both of those values, right? Which I could, you know, I'm using to indicate no driver's license, right? Good questions, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great question. So the question is, can I still use this here? Absolutely. This will work. It's up to you, what you think is clear. I, I, I tend to try to avoid using this when I don't need to. Um, you know, so, so here's a place where you can get in trouble, though, right? Because again, remember what I said before, it's very natural for your constructor to have arguments that match with the names that match the instance variables of your class. So if you do this, now you're in trouble, right? Because you can't, I can't say, that won't work. So I could do this, right? But in that case, I have to use this, right? I can't use, my suggestion is just stick to a convention where you choose a naming convention for 
arguments to constructors or other functions. We're gonna talk in a few minutes about getters and setters. Any function that modifies instance variables on your class. Just pick a convention for naming its arguments that's related to the name of the instance variables that it's modifying. Yeah, Jeremy. Wait, so is off loading Java inside of a class? Yes. Great question. Is all code inside of Java inside a class? Yes. All of it. The MPs you've been working on, you see the class. When you submit the Prairie Learn homework problems, sometimes you don't see the class, but what we're doing is we're taking your code, we're slipping it inside of a class, and then we're running that. Same thing with our lecture examples. Yeah, up in the back. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great question. Post this on the form, and I will explain in detail. So the question is, why are, do we require you to have your parameters be final? This will make a little bit more sense once we talk about object references. Yeah, great question. Okay, let's go on and talk a little bit more about one more thing before we're done. So, so again, now you understand, you know, what a constructor is. You understand why you're using this new keyword. You understand, or at least I've shown you, it'll take you some time to understand this, what happens when you create a new object why the, the, the thing that comes after new looks like a function call. Because it is a function call to a constructor that's defined on that class. So now let's talk about access modifiers. So these have been all over the place as well, and we've been telling you just like squint and, you know, ignore them, right? Public, private, also protected, and there's also something called package private. Um, what are these? So when you're designing a class, it's common to want to make sure that the user of the objects that are created using your class blueprint doesn't have full access to all of the information about the class. They might, you might want to keep things hidden. You might want to keep certain information private. Or you might want to make sure, this is more common, you might want to make sure that that information only gets changed in certain ways and only gets changed in ways so that you know about it. So for example, if I created a person class like this, I might not want to reveal the age, or I might want to do something every time the age was changed. Or I might want to not allow you to modify the age. So this is, so, so we'll talk for the next few slides, and we'll come back and talk about this again on Friday. This is what these sort of, what we call visibility modifiers are for. So Java provides these ways when you design your class for you to use in order to control the access that other people have. These are called access modifiers. So here's some examples on variables, instance variables. So on line three, I'm creating an instance variable called name of type string. And by putting the public keyword, what I'm indicating is anybody can modify that instance variable directly. So anyone who wants to can take a person instance and just change the name. They can get the name and they can set the name just by using the dot syntax. In contrast, the private keyword, and these are really the ones that we're gonna focus on for now, are public and private. There are two other access modifiers. We will come back and talk a little bit about protected later when we talk about inheritance and a little bit more about package private when we talk about packaging. But for now, these are the heavy hitters. These are the ones you need to understand. What private indicates is that only code defined on this method, only, sorry, only this class's methods can modify this variable or even retrieve this variable. So for example, down here on line seven, I'm creating a new instance of person. Line eight will work fine because name is marked as public. Line nine will fail because age is marked as private. So not everybody can retrieve the age of this particular, of instances of this particular class, right? Public, anybody can read and write that variable. Private, the variable can only be read or written by methods on that class. So again, this provides you with an enormous amount of control. Your class can save data, mark it as private, and you now provide all the ways that other people get to use to access that data. It's, it's not particularly common to have private data that 
is never visible to the outside world. But normally what happens is, by marking it private, you can then provide methods that allow other people to access it, but in ways that you control. So we'll see an example of this in a minute. So again, so this works in our, in our playground as well. If you try to run this code, so this is a, a new type of error, new type of compiler error. It says private member cannot be accessed from type example. Why is this? So person has marked the age as private. The code that I'm running when these examples run is defined in a class called example. So it's not defined in the person class. So this attempt on line nine to directly access that age instance variable is going to fail. I can't read it, and I can't write it. So uh, same, same thing here. If I try to say me.age is equal to 10, then I get the error on line nine again. Because I can't set this variable or get this variable. I can do the same thing with functions. So the same keywords work for methods that the class defines. So a public method can be called by anybody. A private method could only be called by other methods defined on that class. So variables, it's get or set. With a method, it's can this method be run. So again, code down at the bottom, I create a new person, instance of the person class, saved a variable called me, print it is marked as public, so I can run that method, print you is marked as private, so I cannot run that method. All right, so again, same example here. Yeah, so down here on print you, it essentially says no method found. The reason is there's no public method found. If I change this to be public, then it works. Now, private methods can be called by other methods on the same class. This is common. You might wonder, like, why would I create a private method? No one can use it. You can use it. Your methods can use it. So, for example, if print it calls print you, I get rid of this direct call here, it works fine. Because the call is coming from another method on the same class. That's okay. So private methods are frequently used to create reusable logic for the same reason we talked about creating functions, but that's only available to that class. So you might create a helper function that you use internally that you don't want to expose to anybody else, but that helper function is now available to other public methods that are defined on that class. If there's a private method that's not used by any of the other methods that are defined on that class, that's not reachable from a public method, then it is sort of a question of, like, why is that there? You know, it's, it, there's no way to ever run it, right? Okay, we're almost done for the day. Like I said, there are two other access modifiers that Java provides, uh, protected and something called package private. Uh, we'll discuss those later. Right? For now, focus on understanding public and private. Okay, so let me finish and we'll, we'll come back and we'll, we'll start up here and review this on Friday. But let me show you a really common pattern. So you might be wondering, you know, why would I mark a variable as private? What, why does that help? What does that get me? Or if I mark an instance variable as private, how does anybody use it? Here's how. So this is something, this is a Java idiom called getters and setters. So instead of having a public field called age, I have a private field called age. And then I have, I, I don't have to provide both, but it's common to provide both. I have what's called a getter and a setter. The getter is defined on line six. It is a public method that returns that instance's age. On line three, I have what's called a setter. So as the name implies, the setter takes an argument that's the same type as the variable that it's setting and sets that variable. Okay? So again, rather than providing a public variable, and in fact, the check style rules that we use don't even allow you, by default, to create public instance variables. You always create them as private, and then create two public methods, or up to two, a getter and a setter. Right? 
So this accomplishes two things. One, it allows you to do stuff when people change the variable. The other thing it does, it allows you to control access to the variable. And so we will pick up here on Friday. Um, we do have a homework problem out today after yesterday's brief break. Uh, it's an important one. These early object homework problems, please do them, because they're really important concepts that we're getting at. Um, if you haven't taken the midterm, good luck. I hope you guys do fantastic. Um, we're gonna release MP3 on Friday. And I'm gonna start holding office hours on Fridays from 10 to 12 for the rest of the semester. Sorry for taking so long to set that up. I will see you all on Friday.